So I designed my first live retreat, Audacious Embodiment, as a feminine reclamation boot camp and the ultimate pattern disrupt of all of the ways we close down, shut off, and choose survival unto death instead of vitality in our lives as women. So I called in an all-star cast to take the stage and expand the permission field of what we get to be as women, who we are allowed to be, and to guide you through shadow work with yours truly, Osho dynamic meditation, family constellation, ancestral song, hair whips and sensual hip grinding routines, creating art out of your longing, twerk, and perhaps the climax, pun intended, of the event where in the able hands of a dominatrix, I gave a surprise to me (laughs) demo on how spanking can be used to alchemize your inner tyrant's voice into love, celebration, and acceptance. It was game-changing, not only for me, but for everyone who was able to witness this. And it is now recorded and available (laughs) for you to partake in. And one of the attendees said, I left feeling so much more attuned and open to my emotions. And I feel this connection to my intuition and my body sensations that I didn't even realize was there. And another said, this past weekend, she opened the door, invited me in and gave me permission to open my heart, move my body and dance, heal my mother wound, say no, say yes, use my voice, honor, respect and admire men, honor my own courage, meet my dominance and submission, meet my edge and go past it. I know that these recordings will translate what occurred <laughs> that weekend and I cannot wait to hear what gets audaciously ignited within you. So check them out. They're available on my shop page and at the link in show notes. We have been duped by feminism, sexual liberation, and antidepressants. We have been told that we are powerful and free now as women, but we feel tired, wired, and bitter. We're mostly eating right, exercising and meditating, wrangling to-do lists and arranging playdates. And yet there's a haunting hollowness beneath the huge complaints. What if I told you that there is a huge storehouse, a reservoir of energy inside of you that has not been tapped, that you could feel light and pulsing, excited and alive in ways that a wellness lifestyle cannot deliver, that you could trust yourself, that the world could feel safe, and that unexpected and expected delights could start to illuminate your path. No coach, therapist, doctor, or guru required. Just you learning to get real, present, and attentive with you. I feel like I'm here to match make your inner parts for the greatest love affair ever written. I want to help you learn first where you're buying eggs from the hardware store, which is the source of all pain. I want to help you master entering through the upset, which is the only spiritual practice you'll ever need. And to get real comfortable putting on your villain crown, which is in my opinion, the key to true power. And then you'll attune to your inner yes. So you can live the life defined by the specific pleasure of who you are. I am so excited to announce my latest book called The Reclaimed Woman, which is available for pre-order now. So if you head to the link in show notes, you can learn more about bonuses, events, and companion offerings. And I cannot wait to see your gorgeous face on the path. I'm Dr. Kelly Brogan. You may know me as a New York Times bestselling author of a book with an exploding pill on the cover, renegade psychiatrist, pole dancer, or honorary member of the disinformation dozen. What can I say? I'm a born provocateur. I've spent most of my recent life exposing deceptions, connecting dots, and discovering the secret places my inner victim is still waiting to be liberated. And now I feel called to help you reclaim all of your parts, your health, your sexuality, your power, and your expression so that you can finally truly own yourself. I want to ignite in you that inner knowing and the pulsing vitality that lives beneath your disempowerment, disconnection, 
and resentment so that you can audaciously, courageously, and playfully alchemize your struggle into the specific pleasure of who you are. This is Reclamation Radio, a Soul Fire production. Hello, and welcome back to Reclamation Radio. I am Dr. Kelly Brogan, and today I want to talk about feminine homecoming on the collective level. And I want to look at dimensions of feminine reclamation that involve our relationship to life-giving forces and our collective relationship to these aspects of existence. My sense is that the pendulum is arriving at a resting place, that we are maturing psycho-spiritually as a collective, and we are moving through a kind of adolescence and perhaps completing a rebellion of sorts. So in women are incarnated what some refer to as the disturbing mysteries of nature. And we see this microcosmically as mothers raise sons, that a man can only escape the grasp of his consuming mother if he rejects her and runs a million miles in the opposite direction. So this escape allows him to find himself, allows him to gain self-awareness and mastery over his surroundings. And this maturational stage of the masculine beyond the consuming feminine or the imagined to be consuming feminine, this stage of defiance establishes self-sufficiency and often involves devaluing the feminine herself. It's a necessary stage. So if we know that this happens on the interpersonal familial level, then we also can see it holofractally on the collective level that there is a maturation of the masculine and feminine almost in a pendulum-like way that will ultimately, hopefully, rest in a place of true complementarity where this imagined zero-sum game is no longer necessary, where the war is over. So if we look at you know, what we know to be of history and we look at this patriarchal monotheistic moment we find ourselves perhaps exiting, we can see that the strategic emancipation from and devaluation of the feminine may have taken the form of commerce, militarism, politics, technology, and the creation of a social stratification system that renders a woman and her gifts largely irrelevant, right? That she doesn't have a role in this new system. And in this new system, monotheistic patriarchal religions are committed (laughs) to objectifying sexuality and specifically a woman's sensuality, sexuality, and erotica to debase and exploit that dimension of the feminine so that we no longer see a woman as infused with eros, right? We see sexuality as separate from a woman's body. And it's very easy to commandeer and control these elements when they are fragmented and projected. So in this very necessary stage in our collective evolution, we are now being presented, I believe, an opportunity for a feminine homecoming as this expression of the defiant masculine, if you will, has come to a full maturation. We have an opportunity for the arrival of a feminine complementarity to match what has been established. And my sense is that the invitation in this homecoming is around choosing life. And as I consider it, there are a couple of different dimensions where we can welcome home as women, feminine life force back into our bodies, back into our wombs. And this is on the personal level, how we can contribute to this collective homecoming. In each of these different categories I'm going to share, there is 
a hopeless victim story (laughs) that has been spun, that can be alchemized. And we have an opportunity to vivify that which has been totally denatured and objectified and stripped of life force. So these forces want to find a home, in my opinion, in a woman's pulsing, vibrating body. So let's see, here's what I got on my list. The first one is nature, right? So if we look at the zeitgeist, you're going to see that there is a, and perhaps it's even agenda driven, who knows, so that there is a resurgence of interest in these different dimensions. And it's happening right now. It's happening in conversations. It's happening in pedagogical realms. It's happening on social media. There is a burgeoning swell of invitation that says, look at this, reconsider this, take this back in. And my sense is that as women, we have a particular responsibility to develop intimate relationships with each of these different feminine forces. All right. So the most obvious one is the natural world. So the victim story, whether it comes to, you know, climate change agendas and hoaxes, or whether it's allopathic brainwashing, the victim story is, you know, it's too late. You know, the earth is damaged. There's nothing we can do. This is all quantifiable. And then on the body, in the nature body, we have the victim story that says, you know, the nature in me is damaged beyond repair, is broken beyond repair. That's what most of the patients I ever worked with in practice came to me declaring, right? So in the invitation to bring nature home, we have so many witches on the scene. We have so many homesteaders coming to inspire us around what it is to develop a relationship with your little patch of nature and to really experience intimacy with the natural world and coming into harmony. We have natural medicine. We have master plants, right? And the, again, (laughs) CIA initiated insurgence of psychedelics, right? Nonetheless, if you look at it all, 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 all as being by design, you can appreciate that there is, you know, there is an unfoldment that is perfect. (laughs) It's totally perfect. And we have this opportunity to, rather than rush to fix, you know, what's wrong with nature on the outside and nature on the inside, to simply feel the grief of our misunderstanding or our incomplete understanding and to alchemize, you know, those victim stories. Okay. So next we have emotions, right? So perhaps the defining Feminine essence is the energy that moves through the vessel and is felt by the body. We have emotions. So the victim story around emotions, of course, is my specialization as a psychiatrist, is that emotions are a pathology. Tears are a symptom criteria for the diagnosis of major depressive disorder. You have a disorder if what it is that you're feeling is unwanted by yourself or others around you. We also have this, you know, you are responsible for how I feel dimension of our microaggression oriented culture that says, you know, my feelings are somebody else's responsibility. My experience is somebody else's responsibility. You owe me this. Right. So the bubbling to the surface that I perceive around me, even in my children's generation, you know, I witness tweens and teens talking about emotional intelligence and emotional responsibility and really honoring emotions and what it is to take time to feel in a way that would have been anathema to me at that age. So this zeitgeist around emotional mastery and literacy and the orientation towards emotions as very meaningful, necessary energies that help us to orient and navigate, but that should not be given the wheel of our car, is something that I see even in pop psychology now. And the homecoming that each and every woman has the opportunity to experience around her emotional life requires that that strong masculine container already be developed so that inside of us, we have the capacity to hold space for our emotional energies 
and to develop intimacy, to prioritize this self-relating. Because what happens when we navigate from that inner hierarchy is that we know exactly what to do and when to do it. Our intuition comes back online. And that is a force to be reckoned with. So next is money. Money. So most of us speaking in polarity terms agree that money is a feminine energy. And there are so many victim stories around money. I can't make more because I have to stay at this job because, and we develop what, you know, the attendings on the ward in the hospitals that I worked at would, you know, talk about in certain patient categories as being fuck you, don't leave me energy, right? We develop this dysfunctional codependent lust for and rejection of the energy of money, you know? But what if, as one of my favorite teachers, Kasha Urbaniak says, money is just a permission slip to live, right? Because we have commodified nature in the way that we have, because you actually cannot occupy any space on this plane unless you are paying to do so. We are in this moment where money is synonymous with the right to exist, with the right to live. And so what if you not only owned that reality, accepted that momentary reality and played the game so that you could welcome home as much of that energy that you could give yourself as much permission as possible that you could invite into your womb space. You could allow your magnetic energy to draw into you as much of that energy as humanly possible. That feels good to me. It feels good to me that every single woman would be doing that. And we also know that this right to live, that this permission to exist is the conduit to our relationship, to our own havingness capacity, because we can learn pretty quickly how much of what we say we want, we can actually have and hold through the play of money, right? If I told you that you had to spend $150 million every month on yourself, you might gasp with the oppression of that, right? As much as if I told you, you know, you had to live on $15 a month, right? So we begin to learn what our spectrum is for, you know, scarcity and abundance and how it is that we can grow that capacity through our imagination, through our creative energy and through our capacity to dream up, you know, scenarios that allow us to play in this field in ways that are distinctly feminine. So I didn't always authentically appreciate the power of the natural world. And maybe this is because I was heavily brainwashed by Western medicine and was in my armored defensive structure as a follow the rules kind of gal. It absolutely was not intuitive for me to look to plants or flowers for actual, literal healing potential. It's just not what I was taught. So as I've been on this path of embodiment, reconnecting with myself and nature, I have found sacred rituals and brands that bring beautiful healing practices into my life and the lives of my daughters. My favorite brand, Lotus Way, has the best quiz for you to really understand which flowers and elixirs are the most supportive for you. If you head to the show notes, you will find a link to a quiz that you can use to choose your most powerful elixir based on what is attractive to you. It's very cool. So don't forget to use my code Kelly15 for 15% off. And in case you're curious, I'm a divine truth and luscious embodiment gal. So have fun. So next is sexuality. So the externalization of sexuality, the segregation of spirituality and sexuality, I explore in a podcast called The Sacred Prostitute here that you can check out. And it is this idea of sexuality as separate from 
the woman that allows for us to perceive women as using their sexuality to get things versus not, instead of this idea that a woman's eros is always running through her system. Her system is actually designed to run that life force at all times. And how she integrates that, how she wields that, how she expresses that and explores that is what makes her unique as a snowflake and also allows her to belong to something bigger than herself through her sensuality and through her sexuality. So the victim stories around sexuality are legion, right? When sexuality is objectified on the outside, we can be victimized as women by other women who identify with the whore or the Madonna. (laughs) So I've been on both sides of this dialectic that when you are in the Madonna virtuousness, right? So when you have secreted your sexuality, then you will feel victimized by women who are you know, libidinally expressed and salacious and, you know, too much cleavage, too much lipstick, too, you know, short skirt kind of a thing. Just as much as when you are in the whore archetype, right? When you are that woman, you know, the pole dancer or whatever, you may experience feeling victimized by the woman who is virtuously imploring that you put it away in the bedroom, right? So in my journey, I experienced the most vitriol of all from the Madonnas in my midst as I began to play with that which I imagined would destroy me and to go on this journey into my own, you know, wilderness, demonstrating my sexual energy and sensuality on the world stage. All right. So it was the Madonnas who were hunting me down for sure. And we also have this victim story that women are powerless. They are vulnerable that men are predators and the warfare that subjugates our sexual energy and renders impossible the free energy technology that is available through a properly polarized man-woman dynamic is really one of the most important areas, I think, to explore. Because in the taboo, in the don't go there, dimensions of our sensuality and sexuality is a tremendous resource is our captured life force energy, our creativity. And that's why I have found, you know, a BDSM and conscious kink. I've done episodes on this called Tantra Boundaries and Sexual Healing with Lori Handlers and a couple of episodes with Omra Pani. I did a solo called Five Ways That BDSM Can Heal Your Life. I have found that there is an opportunity to come into consensual domination which requires that we have a very intimate awareness of what it is that we want, where it is that we derive pleasure, and that we have reclaimed as many bits and pieces of our projected self so that we can show up whole to this organized complementarity and consciously and intentionally transmute that which would cost us in the shame realm otherwise. And when we've only ever known non-consensual domination, this is a real plot twist. (laughs) This is an opportunity to spiritualize sexuality. And we have an opportunity to sexualize spirituality and to bring home to ourselves all of the dimensions of our erotic selves, our erotic life that we otherwise would remain divorced from. So next is water, right? So perhaps the quintessential feminine element. We have a lot of victim stories around water as a so-called resource, right? That there's scarcity around water, that it's either dirty or clean, you know, that it's, it's simply about the contaminants that we can assess this dead fluid, you know, that is water. Well, there are many colleagues that I have and women on the scene like Veda Austin and Isabel Friend who are speaking to the consciousness of water, to water as a living being that we are here to steward, who are speaking to, you know, my friend and 
spirit guide, I'll say, Tom Cowan, has written an entire book on the subject. This idea that water holds information and that the water inside of us and the water around us is the primary foundation for all of the capacity for life force that is available. So in this realm of reclamation, what we do to water, we do to ourselves. How we interact with water informs how we are energetically experiencing ourselves. That you can hold a glass of water for two minutes and pray into it before drinking it, and that that water will then become a living prayer that speaks to your body. This is not, also thanks to people like Gerald Pollack, this is not the realm of, you know, new age, you know, gobbledygook. This is something that is being validated and verified even in grassroots research. So there is an extraordinary reclamation here that I see happening right before my eyes. So lastly is birth. So I've recorded a podcast with Yolanda Norris Clark that will deliver, (laughs) no pun intended, this truth as I see it in epic proportions, because this subject is perhaps the subject I feel most passionately about when it comes to reclamation. And I used to focus on reclaiming birth from the hospital system. And because of her work and my girlfriend, Ayla Cuenca, I now focus on the reclamation from a utilitarian survivalist birth into a blissful orgasmic birth space. Not that I've experienced that firsthand. However, I know it to be possible now and didn't then. And that's part of why I'm so passionate about how essential it is that we know what is possible so that we can orient our yes and our no accordingly. But of course, there are so many victim stories about birth. I mean, how many women have we heard say, you know, birth is hard. I can't have a natural birth because of the size of my baby or, you know, whatever metrics that birth is just about having a healthy baby. It has nothing to do with your experience. Why are you being selfish? And that, you know, fear is the driving decision maker, right? When it comes to the birth experience, the way in which we can alchemize the opportunity that we have to invite into our bodies the experience of childbirth is dimensionally, holofractally, metaphorically, the reclamation of life force. It is choosing life and not just because a baby is born, but because walking into the fire of your own actualization as a woman, crossing the threshold from maiden to mother, perhaps again and again and again, is orienting yourself towards expansion and choosing not to contract into the familiar dimensions of fear. So as we say yes to the homecoming of these feminine vectors of life force energy, as we come into harmonious and pleasurable relationship to each of these different elements. As we explore collectively and individually what this next maturational sovereign stage of feminine actualization is that only could exist because of the ways that the pendulum has swung back and forth through the ages There are a couple of tips that I would give you so that you can orient towards the opportunities. The first is something I spoke a lot about during Audacious Embodiment. The replays are available, P.S., which is what I have learned through Family Constellation and one of the presenters there, Amrly, which is taking your mother. Okay, so what the fuck does that mean? (laughs) Taking your mother. Taking your mother means simultaneously that you experience gratitude for the fact that she gave you life. She was this vessel I was just speaking of for your life to exist. And also what it is to take her as she is and to understand why she needed to be exactly who she is and who she was in order for you to have the opportunities to choose and claim your life force. 
in the ways that you do. The next is to recognize that complaint is rejecting life. One of the major transitions that I've made in my lifescape is towards celebrating and bragging and really predicating my female relationships on that practice. Because like so many of us, I grew up in a family where commiseration connection was the dominant currency of intimacy. And whether you're complaining about your health issues or some horrible thing that happened to you, if you don't have those tales to tell, then what is there to talk about, right? And you become disoriented with regard to your identity. So understanding that celebrating appreciation, gratitude, and mining adversity for the meaning. You know, in my last book, On Yourself, I wrote that suffering ends where meaning begins. This is part of orienting towards the choice to live rather than the withering into death and surviving until, you know, that occurs. In Family Constellation, there is an orientation of each representative towards life or towards death. It's really that simple. So you're compensating for past issues, you know, in your elders and ancestors that have been as of yet unresolved and that you seem to be subconsciously charged with minimizing or mitigating, right? So somebody has, you know, experienced financial devastation or romantic catastrophe. And in order to not feel what it is that they struggled with, you have these patterns and habits that keep you stuck and suffering. And you are compensating for these past experiences. You have loyalties to members of your family line that can be consciously reorganized and constellated so that you can turn towards your own future and choose to walk your story from the belonging that is conferred when you stand in your shoes for yourself. Okay. And lastly is to come into a feminine practice and comportment towards life, which I've heard described in many different ways, whether that is as my Qigong teacher Ming Tang Gu said and taught me in Chinese, it's called Hao La, which is all is well and getting better, or whether it's, you know, how David Data describes the feminine essence as full and always wanting more. <laughs> the experience that we can have of being a lioness on the savannah with a full belly, right? So coming in with our spine strong and also allowing ourselves to be led and navigated by and through our desire requires that we develop a relationship with gratitude and appreciation for what is, that we find a way to love it all. Every single thing that is arising, every single thing that is happening, we say, even if it's a teeny tiny yes, a micro yes, <laughs> we offer that feminine yes. And we also begin to develop an alliance with our impulses. We begin to recognize that what we want cannot be unwanted. So best to learn about the dimensions of that desire, including the shadow desires that are fulfilled in not having the thing that we say we want, exploring our relationship to our own desires. I mean, this is like a full-time job. <laughs> so the practice of living as full and wanting more is a feminine reclamation. And so in these you know, seemingly simple ways, we begin to prepare ourselves to become a vessel to receive back in what we have objectified and participated in objectifying and rejecting, whether it's, you know, something as taboo as money and sexuality, or whether it's nature and water and the complex world of the birth experience, we have an opportunity to participate in this collective reclamation on the individual level. And I hope that that is a helpful sketch of what I see. All right, until next time.